Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Not Too Comic Book. This being a show where I talk about TV shows that are adaptations of comic books. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the latest episode of Pennyworth, as well as the season premiere of Preacher. Like always, if I'm talking about something you want to listen to, you can always look in the description down below. I include a time when I start talking about each of the respective shows. So, for example, if you want to hear what I had to say about this week's episode of Pennyworth, you can skip to what I had to say about the season premiere of Preacher. But the first thing I'm going to talk about is this, this week's episode of Preacher. Pennyworth. A lot of interesting things went down in this episode, so let's break it down. It's very interesting with the whole aspect of, like, obviously after everything that went down last episode, some extraordinary situ circumstances, now you have, you know, Alfred trying to go back to being somewhat of a normal life. He's trying to obviously get his security firm built up and stuff. He ends up running into... Thomas, but Thomas is like, oh yeah, I got a job opportunity for you. It's for the good of your country. But for him, it's like, I've literally been serving my country since I was 16 years old. I'm going to start just serving myself because obviously he doesn't want to get mixed up in anything with Thomas because it's like, yeah, the company you keep led to my girlfriend almost getting killed. The fact of the matter is it led to me killing people, which obviously that's a big no-no for Alfred. Like, you know, obviously he had to do what he had to do in war, but that's like, this is like, he doesn't like, because once again, he justified why he killed people. It was like for his queen for his country now if he did anything like that blood is more so than anything on his hands and his hands alone because it's also interesting too because obviously it's so like esme has her career and everything as an actor and obviously it's like you know you have alfred being like you know the fact of the matter is you might make it big and you have to basically if you have to leave me behind i'll understand she's like what are you trying to leave me he's like no i'm just trying to say like I guess it's his way to always kind of have a foot out the door because I guess for him, he just, he feels like I can never be what you would need me to be. I can never give you the life you want slash kind of deserve more rather, you know, it's like, but for her, it's like, we love each other. That should be enough. But it's like, if that's the case, why have I never met your dad? And she's like, he's not really worth knowing. But part of me is like, that must be a huge plot point or something. Cause I guess like, cause I'm sure for Alfred, it's kind of like, you kind of embarrassed for me to meet your father, you've met both my parents, despite like how crazy that situation was. But the fact of the matter is, I've yet to meet yours. So I'm sure in Alfred's eyes, it's kind of like because I'm not too up to the standards of someone that your dad would want you dating. So either he's someone pretty high ranking and whatnot, or or is he just like an upper class dude or what? I'm curious. Well, because they talked about it before last episode, but I forgot what it was exactly. She said her dad was. So uh, I don't know. I feel like there's got to be extenuating circumstances. It must, it's going to most likely be a situation when they actually we actually meet him. And there, it's probably going to be a twist where he's actually a prime minister or something like that. Maybe. I don't know. I kind of get that inkling like he's going to be someone like that. Like it's going to be a twist when it gets revealed who her dad is. So that's why I'm kind of wondering like, what relevance it'll have to the plot but maybe it's just a oh like maybe it's just a personal relationship story of just how like he just might not be good enough for her in her father's eye type of situation maybe there's other reasons why she's trying to keep alfred away from her dad who knows but i'm interested to kind of dive into that more the episode also deals with like hardwood being tortured and everything in particular it turns out that he is actually the leader of the raven society i mean at least the prime minister is like oh you really are telling the truth aren't you but i'm like is that is that true i don't i don't know like not unless he's broken down but maybe he's under the impression that he is when in actuality there's someone else behind the system or maybe he's just that good at covering up the fact is letting them know what they think but i don't know it seems like he might be truthful about that i wouldn't have expected i would have expected there would be a hierarchy like higher hierarchy than him you know but we'll see going forward um also there's a lot of like like fuck your mom commentary in this not commentary but comments i just think it's kind of interesting because harwood says it to the prime minister he's kind of like oh yeah i've kind of you know he's like the notion has crossed my mind and he's just like basically almost paraphrasing here but almost like the situation is the circumstances allowing for something like that has never arisen you almost have hardwood looking at him like wait what like it's it's so interesting and because there's also the situation with jack uh telling that to alfred he's like oh you know if what was it if you could fuck your mom to save her life, would you? And you have Alfred being like, to Jason being like, now, the fact of the matter is, I think you've been lied to because, what was it? Um, 
because fucking your mom's not going to cure anything. I love that. Like, you turned it around on him like that. But uh, nevertheless, that well, let's kind of get into the meat and potatoes of the episode. I, I've, I said that recently in something else. Regardless, um, essentially, like I said, Alfred's trying to get the business started. There's this dude named Jack who's kind of pushing his weight around. Uh, he's kind of obsessed with um, a lady that worked at the pub. Her name's Sandra. Like, he's just all about her. It kind of obsessed with her. It's like, oh, let her pour her in drinks. And it's like, oh, everyone thinks you're a good girl, but I know what you are type of thing. Essentially, it's like she smiled and gave attention to the wrong dude. And now he's just pestering her all the time. Um, it seems interesting. I guess that is Sid's daughter because he was like, yeah, my girl. So I'm like, oh, but I guess like he's just not sticking up for her like he should, I guess. But it's also because of who Jack is related to. He's a man, related to a man from the man from White Cap, uh, Chapel, which no one says his actual name because he's that much of a dangerous dude. And obviously, you know, you even have like Sid being like, oh, basically saying like, oh, I can pay you to off him. But obviously that's not something Alfred would do. He's even like, I don't know anyone that would do something like that. Obviously, we know like Dave isn't above doing that. But that's a whole, once again, complicated thing in itself. But, you know, Alfred wants to help, but he doesn't want to kind of get mixed up, especially if it means getting involved with who we later on find out is John Ripper. Now, what's interesting, though, is, you know, Dave is talking to Alfred saying, like, oh, how he's changed that basically. But Alfred's like, I'm trying to live a good life. I'm not trying to get mixed up in something dangerous again. I'm trying to live a good life, get my business started so I can settle down and have kids. But it's almost kind of like. You've forgotten who you are. Like the Alfred I know wouldn't be so wouldn't be scared to just say some dude's name. He'd get basically he'd get shit done, you know? So and I think that's kind of an interesting element to kind of deal with with, you know, Alfred. Because Alfred, you know, who he is that I mean, and it's like any soldier coming back from war, who he was then versus who he is now, you know, because he doesn't want to go down that route of doing something like yeah, maybe when he was younger, maybe when he was in the army, he would have done certain things. But now after everything, after all the fighting, all the killing, it changes you. It you makes you want to be a different person. And Because I'm sure for Alfred, he wants to distance himself as far as he can from that. So that's why he doesn't want to just kill people. So he doesn't want to get mixed up in a situation like this. He wants to live a normal life and just like uncomplicate things. He wants to li live a life that isn't complicated whatsoever. But when the time came, you know, Alfred does decide to help. It turns out it's kind of interesting because Alfred, has a double motive in this because obviously he's doing everything for Sandra's sake sure but he's also doing it for his own sake that situation ended up playing out interestingly like obviously uh, Jason and his boys confront Alfred and Alfred and ba Baza and um Dave ended up like kicking all their asses obviously Dave can get a little more heated into it because that one particular guy he started beating on him more and more and Alfred and Baza had to stop him to be like yo cool it down so Al Alfred gets past John's uh, security and confronts him directly and is like, yo, like, basically, we, we need to talk. And lo and behold, it cuts back to uh, Baza and Dave messing with uh, Jason really bad, blindfolding him and threatening him and calling, oh, your name is Weasel. It's not Jason. You're Weasel. The way you're just, like, wriggling around, that smell, that's terror. Terror smells very different than fear. Even to the point, like, they're like, oh, get the tools. He's like, no, 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 fine, I'll leave Sandra alone. And Baza's like, Sandra? Like, we care about Sandra. That's kind of basically making it seem like they're just doing this for their own reasons. They were, like, terrifying him, like I said, the tools and everything. And you could tell they were messing with him when they got the bag and everything. I was like, yeah, you're severely messing with him, trying to scare the piss out of him. And it's like, fine, what we really want to know about is John, your uncle John. Tell us everything you know about him. Yes, sir. He's like, my name is Weasel, sir, and stuff like that. And lo and behold, takes the blindfold off, blindfold off, and lo and behold, there's Alfred with his uncle. And it's like, okay, so the whole point was to show his uncle, like, your nephew is kind of a weakling and you don't want to trust. Like, kind of using this as a win-win situation. For one, getting him out of um, Sandra's life because Alfred's like, yo... The fact of the matter is, look at your nephew, and John's like, you know what? If you weren't my sister's kid, I'd skin you right now. But basically, she's been through enough, so you leave and never come back. If I ever see you again, I will cut your face off. Which I, there was a part of me that was thinking that maybe on some level he might try and retaliate against Sandra, you know, Jason. But then again, it's like, well, I guess when there's someone like your uncle, you heed his words and you leave when he tells you to leave. Um, I guess that in itself also shows you kind of who 
Alfred is as a character, just the fact is that he found another way of dealing with this situation. You know, once again, like a nonviolent way of not just beating a dude up, not just killing him because neither one is a solution. Well, obviously beating him up is not going to do anything. It just causes more problems later on. This is a more permanent solution to get him out of Sandra's life. But then, like I said, the other side of things, it also shows you a bit of Alfred's character that he's willing to make a deal with John. Like this whole thing, like I said, was a bit of a gamble. It's like I knew I could make this kind of a win-win situation. The fact is you would even do that because even later on, Dave is like, you're literally making a deal with the devil. It's like we've made a deal with the devil before. He's like, yes, many times, but maybe that's just too much. You know, because even Dave's like, I'm not even telling you what you did is wrong. I'm just telling you what it is. The fact is that you would join up with some bad guy like this. Like I was telling you to kind of be more taking action and stuff like that. Sure. Didn't necessarily think you would kind of go this route. And that's, I think that's kind of interesting that Alfred would go down this route. But then again, this is supposed to be a younger Alfred. You don't learn from your mistakes. Like the fact of the matter is for now, it looks like a beneficial situation. It's a situation that paid off. It's going to help increase his business and stuff like that. Sure. But it's the thing of like when you make a deal with the devil, you never know what the price is ultimately going to be. Obviously, this is something he's keeping from everybody because if everyone really knew who he was doing business with, dude, it would kind of cause a lot of issues but you know Alfred's trying to get ahead in life because he he wants so much he wants to build his life for Esme I even love like the whole thing of her going you know doing her performance and she's like oh you want to go again tonight he's like again I mean he's like I'd, I'd love to because he wasn't he didn't realize that like oh it, the performance is multiple nights obviously this is well it's I'm about to say it's early they they duh, days of theater but it's like no it's not uh so it, it was just kind of an interesting element but like I said getting back to it I think that's just one of the main reasons why because he wants to have something of his own because everything he's ever done before has been for his country it's like I need to build something of my own to have as my own something that will secure my family's future to secure my future you know I mean that was literally points he made last episode he wants to be his own man so he's willing to potentially do whatever it takes which is interesting too because like obviously there's the whole thing of Thomas offers offering him a job but then you have the inspector being like oh yeah like has Thomas kind of approached you about anything? Essentially, not saying Thomas's name, but someone a familiar face might come and approach you with a job that's a little too good to be true type of situation, and the rewards are exceptional type of situation. Obviously, Alfred doesn't tell him like, "Oh yeah, I met with this person," but essentially, Aziz was kind of like, "If you meet with this person, um, I will t come to me and I will tell you all about their organization that they're working for," which is kind of interesting to think, you know. Thomas might be potentially working for a very not so a very shady group or whatever. Like what that group is necessarily, we haven't really dive in, div, uh, dived into, but I'm very interested to find out, you know, what it is. Because Thomas alluded to it last episode, like obviously it's like a government job and stuff like that. But still, like without dropping too many details, it's like, what are you up to? What are you doing here? What is it you're trying to get Alfred mixed up in? A lot of interesting questions on that front, you know? We have him proposing to Esme, which is kind of dope. I love it, him being like, oh, you're a princess. The fact of the matter is I'd slay any dragon for you. I'll always be there for you. I'll always protect you. I will always love you with all my heart. I'm like, oh, that's so adorable. Um, but proposes to her, which is like, and she says yes. It's like, that's awesome. Once again, you never, once again, like, maybe that's something that's come up a lot. Once again. This series is my first time really diving into Alfred's past. Other than this, Gotham's the only other thing, material I've ever known. Because obviously everything else is just Batman focused. So Alfred's story is never really that important. To be fair, in like Gotham, it was a whole bunch of other people's stories. It was Jim's story. It was Bruce's story. And, you know, obviously Alfred's story is tied to Bruce's. But it's also kind of understanding who he is and how why he is in the position he's in. And now we're I obviously we're going further back to understand how he got to where he was, you know, working for the Waynes, eventually becoming the protector of the Dark Knight, you know? So it's it's just kind of interesting when you break it down like that. Then there's everything with uh, Sykes. I love her story of just kind of like, you know, g uh, like getting all friendly with uh, George. And she was like, oh, I don't have any weapons. The moment he grabbed her hand, I was like, she's going to bring you over and bash her head in or something. I was like, oh, no, she didn't. Because Sykes is in it for the long game. The fact of the matter is they get close. They bang it out a couple times to the point she uses that to blackmail. Because it's like, oh, look at the great power of modern medicine the fact that or science because oh they'd be able to tell your dna from this semen because she kept the condoms i'm like wow 
I mean, she knows how to strike and strike hard in that regard. I just thought that was kind of fascinating. And it's like, so deliver these like letters like I want you to. One goes to Esme, which is interesting. She's like, oh, the fact is, if I were out of prison, the fact of the matter is, I'm sure we'd be good friends. You know, forgive and forget, as I always say. And it's just like, obviously, like Esme has always been worried about this, even to the point Alfred asked uh, Inspector Aziz about it, you know, about where, you know, Sykes was just to kind of at least so it eases his mind as well as Esme's. But then later on, it's like, oh, all this stuff is setting up for her to be executed. And the executions are brutal. Not only do you hang, they also slice your stomach open and let your guts fall. I was like, Jesus. I didn't expect that, and it did, like, multiple times, and then, obviously, you know, psych situations comes up, and, lo and behold, who saves her? Her sister, Peggy. I thought that was interesting. I wonder, I guess that was kind of the whole point, kind of a Hail Mary, hoping your sister would come and save you, which she did, but the letter didn't say anything, but maybe the whole point was because that way, when the time comes, like, it doesn't look suspicious, like, if someone does look at the letter, it just looks at her, like, her saying goodbye, so I was like, I wouldn't expect you to say, come and save me, but uh, I guess that message in itself was the message of, like, yo, sis come help me out so Sykes is free and her and her sister I'm sure are going to cause some havoc I'm so curious because obviously like Alfred as well as Esme are under the impression that she's dead so they're going to have their guards down but obviously like you even saw in the first episode it seemed like Esme had taken a, a very good bit like a good liking to Esme so I'm curious to see like has she kind of borderline become obsessed with her like, when she touched her leg, I assumed it was more than just, like, oh, friends. I think, I would assume there's more to it, the whole dancing and stuff, too. But maybe not. Maybe it is just kind of like, oh, Sykes has never really had any friends, so her attachment to people comes off very extreme because she doesn't have that many people in her life like that. Maybe. I don't know. I wonder what it is about Esme she found so fascinating. Obviously, she got super pissed when she thought, like, Esme was, like, everyone else looking down upon me, treating me like dirt. So, I guess that contributes to the whole thing of her not really having potentially any friends. So, I'm very interested to kind of dive in to find out what that's all about. Obviously, like, like I said, there's so many damn secret societies and stuff running around. Obviously, we're dealing with the Raven Society. There's still the no-names we haven't even really touched on. Obviously, everything with John Ripper and just him... How can you join forces with a dude named John Ripper? I think that would say a lot, but it's definitely going to be interesting to see what waits Alfred and everyone else kind of along this path. But I'm very interested to see what the next episode has in store for us. And now moving on to the season premiere of Preacher. A great premiere. Crazy way to start off the season two um, with, in many different regards. For one, that cold opening of it being basically a little ways into the future. The whole Cassidy and Tulip situation. And then Jesse flying off out of a plane and landing dead. Big question is, was he dead before uh, he left the plane and hit the ground, or was him hitting the ground what killed him? Because obviously Jesse ain't nothing supernatural. Not unless we end up finding out later on that Jesse ended up becoming supernatural before that point, so it didn't kill him. I don't know. It's kind of interesting, and I like how they hard cut that to, you know, Cassie and, you know, Tulip doing their thing, and, you know, Jesse being alone and dead, to Tulip and Jesse in her car and doing the whole to the end of the world, to the end of the world thing. And it's just like, huh, that's definitely going to be interesting to see how we get to that first scene. But um, obviously picking up, I would say, fairly soon after season three's ending. I'll pretty much say we're literally right there picking up afterwards. So we get our introduction fully to Masada. Obviously, we got introduced to it last season, but this was like our first true good introduction to it. And... um. This is our first time, you know, getting to see the insides and everything fully and seeing that basically it is the grill training grounds, but it's treated like a school in certain areas because there's lockers. Some of the grill students have like backpacks and it's weird. There's beginner torture. There's uh, intermediate torture. And then it's like, oh, there's something about what was it? It was like a French class or something. And then it's like, oh, move to slate. And it's like, no, actually, it's a uh, advanced torture or whatever. And it's like, OK. Um, the dude, Frank, who got called in at the end of season three, 
uh, he's there to torture Cassidy, and to Cassidy's like, oh, dude, come on, I've been tortured, I've had hundreds of different things done to me, there's nothing you can do to hurt me, and it's like, oh, no, well, that changes when he starts cutting off Cassidy's foreskin, I'm like, Jesus, and because of the whole thing of regenerating, it grows back, slices off again, I'm like, oh, my God. It's actually, which is, I know this is going to sound messed up. It's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Because I was thinking, like, is he cutting off Cassidy's dick? Oh, my God, dude. That's right. Not seeing, like, his cutting his foreskin off is, like, a walk in the park. It's, like, it's just, it could be worse. Still, I, regardless. Then you had that, I'm curious what that was all about. That whole moment also inside of the bar where, like, all those Grail agents were fighting. I guess it was a disagreement or something. But then that one dude stands up and starts singing. And Cassidy and Tulip there. And I'm like, all right, sorry about ruining your sing-along. But I love it. It's like, oh, yeah, like, so Tulip's the boss now. So you kind of have to follow her orders and everything. Which there's so much to kind of break down and I love about this. Obviously, Jesse being a badass, showing up the way he does, literally only a lighter in hand. Obviously, you know... Hair ain't no stupid. He's got earmuffs on him and everyone, and he has a lady there to translate everything for him. But like the lady's deaf, so it's not like you get any ideas from that. So I love Jesse kind of being an asshole, being like, "Oh, here, if you just take off your earmuffs, I'll make it so that you can wear hats again." I was like, "Right, right, you can't wear hats anymore." Uh, all right, because I forgot they also did that subtle like hard cut when Cassie's getting his foreskin cut off it hard cuts to the top of Hare's head you know obviously penis head and I love that and it's just kind of like you know it's like I don't think so Custer he's like you know what I got a different plan this time and Jesse's just kind of like there's silence and he's like don't you want to know yes fine tell me what your different plan is he's like I'm gonna carve a vagina into your head it's like I love how petty hair is. He acts like he's above it all, but because it is like, you made me penis head, I'm going to make you vagina head. It's just like, you're, that's like such a kid response. But I love like the whole situation of, oh, one of those guys, I snuck him in here. He's actually here. He ends up killing everyone in the room. Jesse gets taken to uh, Cassidy. And it's like, hey, it's almost a somewhat happy reunion. Because obviously Cassidy's still a little spiteful for this Jesse. And Jesse, him, like Jesse's a little more like, hey, I'm happy to see you. But also like, man, what did he do to you? He's like, he cut my foreskin off. And Jesse kind of cracks a smile. He's like, are you laughing at me? He's like, no, 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 of course not. It's like, in a twisted way, it is kind of funny that he cut your foreskin off. You know, you feel bad for him. But at the same time, it's like, that's super messed up. And obviously, uh... Jesse doing his badass thing, whole bunch of grill people come in, taking them down in fashion. It's just like, oh, you're so good at that. And then at one point, it's like Frank. You see him start punching Frank. And there's even a smile that comes across Cassidy's face because I think it's like, yeah, my best friend came to save, save me. And then I think maybe he sees the look on Jesse's face that Jesse's enjoying it. And I think maybe it goes away because for him, it's like, it's one of two things. One, he's reminded he kind of hates Jesse right now. Two, it might be because it's, well, two, it could be like, hey, I could, he even says it later on. It's like, I had him right where I wanted him. I, I could have, you know, gotten myself free. So it kind of ties in with two. Or three, maybe it's like, oh, you're just doing this for yourself. You don't really care about me. Because he, he feels like that. You know, that was a conversation even last season. But it's still holding a grudge against him. Because the last time they saw each other, it's like, oh, you, well, not necessarily the last time they saw each other. But the last time they were on somewhat friendly terms together, you were cutting me into pieces and shoving me in a box. And don't know, don't think I didn't notice you didn't put me in first class or whatever, you know. And it's like, I literally cut you up to save you, but like, because Cassidy, I guess, is so prideful and just, he's so stubborn, he won't let it go. And the entire time him and Jesse are escaping his bitching and complaining, so it's like back and forth about everything. I even love it, like, oh yeah, Cassidy presses the elevator button and Jesse doesn't mind. It's like, why'd you do that? I already pressed the button. He's like, well, I guess I pressed it again. Man, this elevator's slow. He's like, well, I've run it slower. It's like, why are you making everything into a competition? Oh, good for you. You've ridden on an even slower elevator and whatnot. I even love Jesse being like, aren't you just going to thank me? He's like, yeah, thanks. My foreskin thanks you. See? Is that so hard? Then I also love like the whole situation with Tulip and those uh, Grail agents that's on her side. That lady, Tammy, keeps calling her boss. That was brutal. Like Tammy, She's like, keep that door open. Tammy's like, got it. Tammy literally stands there to keep the door open. I'm like, oh, that's not going to keep work. And then like, okay, is that door still open? Don't hear nothing. Tammy got squished in the door. It's like, oh my God. I love Tula's trying to open the door. It takes her a little while. It's not until Tammy starts. She's almost like, holy shit, you're still alive. She's like, yep, I got this boss. 
it's like don't she's like don't even it's like yeah actually there is a button to this door but it's up there don't worry we got this boss it's like oh poor tammy you feel kind of bad for tammy it's such a twisted situation i love this show for being as crazy as it is but what obviously you know once again jesse and cassidy get into it again this is their third fist fight to a certain extent. They fought at the end of season two. They fought at the beginning of season three. Technically, I guess you made the argument this is their fourth fight in actuality because of what went down in the tombs. So yeah, so technically this is their fourth fight. And so it's like, oh, the door opens, they stop. But Jesse goes through, but Cassie doesn't. He's like, I got this. It's like, what? What? What are you doing? And you see it almost kind of bothers both of them. I think you see it like Cassie. I think there's a part of him that's like, I'm being stupid. I should just go. And then Jesse's like, I should do something. I should. Because at no point in time did. And I think that speaks volumes. Jesse didn't use the uh, the word on um him. Because he could have given done the word to make him never talk about Tulip again, but he didn't. I was assuming he was going to. He could have used the word to force him to come, and maybe that's where he's kind of like, damn it, why didn't I just use the word to force him to come? It's like, yeah, Cassidy is my best friend. I should have saved him. And even Tulip's like, what's going on here? Like, well, we're going to go in there. We're going to force him. We're going to save him and drag his dumb ass out. And then you have Cat, you have Jesse go, did you sleep with Cassidy? She's like, What? And he's like, did you sleep with him? I, just tell me the truth. I won't be mad. I don't know if he... I, well, because it clicked in my head. I was like, holy crap, right. Jesse, because obviously he found that out because Cassidy just kind of rubbed salt in the wound, brought that up at the beginning of season three. Jesse never asked Tulip about it because I guess maybe there's some part of him that didn't want to know. But hearing, you know, Cassidy talk about how much he loves Tulip, even the point is that Tulip was like, did you tell him I was out here? Like, that in itself probably triggered something in Jesse to be like, oh, so you being out here would be enough to make him come back, right? So, it's been bothering him, and he just, I think on some level, he just didn't want to know, so that's why he didn't ask. I think maybe he wanted to believe that Cassie was saying that just to be a dick, but now he wants to actually know, he, but Tulip says no, which we know that's a lie. Granted, it was the one time, sure, which is also ironic, considering the fact is we know because of the opening scene that potentially they're going to hook up again later on, so that in itself is kind of fascinating. I think legitimately, you know, Tulip is scared to tell him just like i guess the whole like just like the whole jesse and vic thing it's like you know she was kind of scared to talk about the whole victor thing you know because it's like oh yeah because i was afraid he was gonna kill me i mean to be fair he was like super pissed but you know so maybe it's kind of a similar circumstance in that regard i mean she did kind of hide the fact is that she was married beforehand so to you know to victor and everything so it's not like it's the first time she kept something from jesse but it's like it's interesting that she doesn't just go ahead and admit it because it's not like it was a recent thing it's literally back in season one it was a one-time thing you and her you and um her and jesse weren't even together together at that time you know so nevertheless then we find out later on why Hera let him get away. It was because apparently God was like, yeah, no, you even you didn't just put him down, you know, talking to Hera, being like, you didn't just put him down because you want him to suffer. And like, so basically, let's work together to make him suffer. And it's like, what, what are you getting out of this? Obviously, we know you want him out of the way because Genesis is an issue that even you are worried about what Genesis can do to kind of interfere with your grand plan. What's also interesting is apparently God's a big fan of Diet Dr. Pepper. That was interesting. I didn't even talk about it, but I did love uh, to uh, going up there. I was like, and there was that one frail, I was about grail agent up there. I'm like, it has to be Featherstone. It literally can't be anyone else. Lo and behold, it's Featherstone. They shoot and their bullets hit each other and they're like, because at first they're like, wait, did we get, did I get hit? And they walk over and look and they look at their bullets had smashed together and literally both of them at the same time are saying, cool. They are literally kind of the same person. They are just, just as hot tempered and just as crazy as each other, but they pursue, they go into a fight. Tulip gets, falls off the edge. Luckily, the chair that was holding him was still like a branch or something was there until it climbs back up. I even love her being like, huh, that's for that sucker punch, which I guess you make the argument technically Tulip sucker punched her twice. If you count the first time 
um, when um, in the bushes, which I, I'm kind of with Tulip, that doesn't count as a sucker punch, but but the one that really kind of counts as, I guess, as the sucker punch is when she was making that joke of, well, when Tulip was like, where's Osaka? She's like, it's in Japan, you idiot. And she was like, punched her in the stomach. I guess that could be, the in particular, the sucker punch she could really be referencing. Or she could be talking about the first one and not counting the second one. Because she said punch, not punches. So, either way, me, caught it, me getting caught up in details. But uh, Tulip comes back up, holds over the edge. It's like, you know, you can fall or whatever. And she's like, oh, I could die a martyr. Let's her go. But she spreads her arms and legs and her suit becomes like a flight suit. And she glides to the ground. It's like, of course. So, because I was wondering, I was like, oh, wow. And because she started diving, I'm like, what are you, are, is there something down there that you're diving towards? It's like, oh, no, because you knew your suit was a flight suit. Interesting enough. So, that was fascinating. Then you have that thing at the end where Jesse is having a vision. Basically, his dad calls him. Basically, you see, I guess, the apocalypse happening outside. And his dad's telling him he's got to continue his search for God because there's so much more. There's something coming after him. Then, like, he has that dream about him killing or strangling Tulip, and he can't stop himself. So, multiple things. One, I'm sure that vision came from God himself. Like, he's sending Jesse down a specific path. He needs Jesse isolated and alone without anyone to kind of back him up. So... I'm assuming that's all part of the plan. Maybe there's something else here. I don't know. But I'm assuming the reason why he didn't tell, the reason why he kind of snuck away and left Tulip behind is because I think that dream could be interpreted as like, if I keep Tulip around me on this mission, she's going to die. And I, I'll leave her behind if it means saving her. I've got to track down God and stop all this stuff that's about to happen. So there's that. I love that, you know, on his road trip, that lady, you know, had talked about something like basically she electrocuted two people in a like a jacuzzi or something. And it was at a point she was like, yeah, I have to stop doing porn. I'm like, I want to hear the rest of that story. I love how we just hear the end of it. I want to hear the rest of your story. But then lo and behold, it's like, oh, yeah, there's a kid on the side of the road. What about it? It's like, oh, that's probably not a Christian kid or something like that. Just to go to check. And literally, the, just like the lady was like, oh, it's probably a thief or something. Literally, the kid is trying to rob Jesse, pretending that the dog is dead, but the dog actually pops up. And Jesse's like, drop the gun. The gun drops, actually kills the dog. And it's like, oh, Jesse hands over everything, his wallet, his money, and his boots, even though he was like, not the boots. Just because I think he felt bad because it's like, yeah, technically, yes, you were running a scam on me. Sure, as a thief himself, I don't think he can judge too much. But it's also because like, yeah, I, I kind of killed your pet, so sorry. So there's that. And then literally later on, we have another chain reaction situation like that with the two people on the, like, the camels. I love that they're like across from each other yelling at, it, at each other. It's almost like a drive-by argument on camels. And then they stop. And Jesse's like, come on, stop fighting. Get together. Like, be happy together or whatever. You know, hug it out, essentially. One dude goes over to hug it, but the other dude shoots. That dude... His sword flings out his hand, kills his camel. The camel's blood sprays on the dude with the gun. The dude with the gun shoots his camel. The camel dies and lands on top of him, killing him. And it's like, the the chain reaction in the show is crazy. It's nuts. And it's like, why didn't he listen? Even I was like, well, how did that happen? It's like, because he doesn't speak English. I was like, wait. I was like, wait, what? Once again, showing you the limitations of the word of God. I love that. It's like, well, we know it's like all you have to do is like muffle your ears and the word can't work on you. Also, or you play music loud enough, it can't work on you. But also, apparently, if you don't speak the same language as the person who's speaking with the word of God, I would have assumed it was like a universal translator. Apparently not, because when a command comes out in English, it's because Jesse's speaking in English. I just thought that was kind of fascinating. It's such a small detail. That must have, that's, there must be, they must be playing with that later on or something. The fact is they, because they've never dropped that before now. That it's not a universal language to word. It speaks whatever language the hosts speak. I just thought that was kind of fascinating. So, like I said, I get the feeling like they're setting it up for later on, but maybe not. So, Jesse ends up, you know, getting ready to go to on a plane. It turns out the place he's looking for is in Australia. Uh, it's like this penis-shaped rock. 
Uh, he meets up with a pilot. He needs to go track down his lighter. It leads him to track down a lady's truck. And it's like, oh, someone's in there and is in danger. Isn't there some kind of like rules like by a preacher or something that you kind of have to do something, step in when something like that happens? But the pilot is like, well, even if it's not for preachers, there's a rule like that for pilots. So he goes in to try and save the day and just is like <sighs> follows behind him, which was like interesting. It's so interesting because it seems like Jesse is in this to kind of save the day, but at the same time, not save the day. I guess, you know, it, it kind of goes back to a whole conversation that happened last season. Like, obviously, like his grandmother and him, like younger him when he was like a teenager, were talking about like, oh, you're still following that Custer rule that if you do enough good, it can offset the bad that you've done. I think that still kind of applies to Jesse being like, oh, fine, whatever, you know, trying to do the right thing. I mean, everything he does is about trying to do the right thing. Um, along with all that, you have everything with Tulip. I was wondering why that bartender, uh, Kumal, was looking after her. It seems like he knows Tulip because he, he refers to her as like Nissa at one point in time. So it's like, wait, because I thought like her, um, her uncle wasn't. Yeah, I think it was her uncle and... Anvil was like the last family she had, so he must be someone from her past in a sense, like maybe someone she robbed with, or maybe someone. Cause I didn't know because because he kept referring to Jesse as her husband, but it was like she's like he's not my husband, so it's like so he must not know Jesse like that, or maybe he just maybe that's just pure assumption. But it was just kind of like, huh? That was just like a little detail. I'm like, not unless I misheard it, but it sounded like he called her Nissa, almost like, oh, I know you. So it's like, what's that all about? Because he's even saying like, oh, maybe you should go through with a different plan. The fact of the matter is, maybe you should wait. But Tulip's like, I don't wait for anything or anyone. Obviously, you can tell it's just like, I want to rush and save Cassie. But also, I'm not going to let Jesse bailing on me stop me from doing what I need to do. You know, and just how Tulip is. She's very hot tempered and it's like, I'll do what I need to do. All the while, you know, you have... Cassidy on the inside, you know, managing to get free because he chews his foot off. Interestingly enough, we still don't know anything about home dude up there with the wings. Is he an angel? Like, because in season three's finale, I couldn't tell what he was. I was like, is that like some mystical creature? So is he an angel? I mean, because angels don't really have wings in this show. That's why I'm like, I don't know what he is. Or is he something else? Uh, just, uh... Cassidy's cellmate, I guess, is we'll just kind of be referring to him as. I, I, I don't know what the hell that's all about. So Cassidy gets free. Uh, he ends up going into what was it? The urban blight section of the uh, grill at well, Masada. And it looks like, oh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of um. It's basically the drug section, which is like, oh, that's super messed up when you think about it. I even love it when he's leaving. He's like, you should be ashamed of yourself, I guess, because of it being the urban blight and whatnot. So that's interesting. But, I, I you know, the druggie that is Cassidy's like, oh, my God, this is amazing. But he's like, you know what? Never mind. No, 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 no. I'm not going to do that. Um, I love him trying to leave and everything. But he ends up circling back for the drugs later on, which lets him get caught. So that was interesting. Frank brings up something interesting when he tortures him because it's like i get what your whole thing is you're to screw up the fact of the matter is it's like because he kept wondering it's like why is it you had op ample opportunities to leave but you did he could do it twice once yes it's with jesse so you can make the argument okay that's why he didn't do it two the fact is that you did that and you you, you had a, you got out on at least on your own and it's like but you still didn't take the chance he sabotaged himself at every turn. So the question becomes why? And he was like, basically dealing with people like you is usually out of guilt. They believe they deserve this. So it's like, is that what this is all about? Does Cassidy believe he deserves this punishment? For what? You know, because like someone had pointed out during one of the trailers, I think it was like the teaser in particular, you can see flashes of maybe Cassidy during a, a, one of the wars or whatever. So it's like, does it have something to do with that? Is it about the whole Jesse and Tulip thing? Is it just the... um? Acarius situation, well, Acarius as well as like everyone else that died except for uh, Keith and his grandma. I'm like, is it something with that or what? What guilt is he feeling? I guess maybe it's because let's not forget he's always felt guilt about being a vampire anyway. So maybe he feels like being punished for that, or maybe he feels like I destroy every and ruin every relationship. So it's just kind of like I I don't know. I'm interested to dive into that. Like, what could that be about? Because like I say, at first I thought it was just, oh, because you don't want any help from Jesse. But it's like, even like knowing that Tulip's out there still wasn't enough for you. So it's like, what are you what are you doing, Cassidy? I'm trying to understand, you know? 
I love that um, now uh, Hare has become the new Allfather, and that one dude from New Zealand questions him, and they put him in a box with a grenade, he, and he, literally his last words, somebody wipe my search history. It's like, I love, I think that, those are the final words that a lot of people can resonate with. It's, it's just so crazy to me. And it's like, oh, does anyone else have any questions? You'll meet the Messiah soon enough. I love that too, cause I'd for, I'd forgotten about the fact that just the whole clone thing, right? I'd completely forgotten about that, and I was like, how the hell are you gonna? I was like, oh, did they finally track him down? Like the moment he was running towards the fence, I was like, the fence is electrified. He's going to touch it and ends up dying, and he's actually dead. And he hair's trying to cover for it. It's like no, they throw him a stick because they they're trying to. Uh, see if he can do the tap dancing. I was like, that's such a genius thing. Only the real Messiah, uh, the real Humper Dude, knows how to do that. So I was like, of course. I was like, that's so interesting. Of course, that's how you'd be able to, to determine which one's the real him and which one's the fake. So that was such a, such a fascinating little detail. Because I was wondering how you, like, once I remembered it, I was like, how are you, how are you supposed to handle that situation? I wasn't expecting him to be able to handle it, but that is quite a surprise. And then on top of that, we see that Hare decides to get a replacement for his ear and uses none other than Cassidy's foreskin for it. It's like, Jesus. Why are you... I, I guess it's better than nothing. Also, I talk, forgot to talk about that. Getting his ear blown off. That was very, very interesting. It's like, well, you're down one eye and you're down one ear, so... I also love... Um, Tulip's plan. That was actually really ingenious. Because the moment, like, it was like, oh, the dude was like, someone stole my car. I was like, oh, I guess one of the other people stole his car. I was like, why would they do that? And he has to, like, ride along with uh, Featherstone. And they're driving and stuff like that. I'm like, okay. The moment, like, the car starts kicking up the dust and stuff, I'm like, it starts kicking. I was like, Tulip's in. She's the one that stole the car. She's wearing her blonde wig and uh, the the uh, grail suit because she admitted it that she still had all that from the Osaka job. And so, which is interesting, because she still has the wig from the bank heist going after, um, when they were planning to rob, uh, Sabine of her souls and stuff, but, but, uh, because I was like, right, because those, she didn't utilize that when she was pretending to be a grill person in, um, Osaka, but nevertheless, I'm just, I'm just getting caught up in details, but I thought it was I was like, oh man, she obviously is already on her way there, but then lo and behold, like, all the Grail people got taken out because the dust was making them crash into each other and one into, like, a ditch or whatever. It was like, it was a whole thing. I was like, holy crap. And I love that Featherstone's car couldn't go up the slope because of how small and shitty they are. I love it. And then lo and behold, it gets revealed that Tulip was at her one the car was there. She just pretended to be a part of the accident. So that's how she sneaks her way into Masada. So I was like, that's really good. Dude, holy crap, that's really good. Uh no other way to kind of get it except for that. That's pretty damn sneaky. I like that a lot. Uh but along with that, we see that God kind of has a lot, kind of like toy models of everything. It's a toy model of Tulip's car, the plane that Jesse's on, as well as like the church from Anvil. So it's like kind of showing that like everything is going according to his plan, that every little thing is kind of marked. Oh my God, I completely forgot to talk about kind of showing you who God is too. The fact is, it's like, oh, he made a dinosaur, or rather, my new creation's dinosaurs, and he sees a double rainbow, he's like, oh, and like, oh, look at my great creation. It shits, and then it eats its own shit, and that's when he was like, this was a test, and you failed. You you literally wiped out all dinosaurs because one of them ate his own shit. Really? I guess that shows you just kind of like the low bar he holds for some creatures. I guess it's also supposed to be symbolic of what this whole situation is supposed to be about. What his grand plan is. His test and all of that. You know, he brought up the tulip last season and stuff. Pass and fail type of thing. So, I am so fascinated to see more about what he's up to. Because this is our first season really getting to see that. Like, obviously, he wasn't there at all in season one. He pops up for a well, we don't know it was him at the time, but obviously he pops up a tiny bit in season two. Season three, we obviously saw more of him, but I feel like this season is going to be the season we see a lot more of him. Also, uh, we see that Eugene and the Saint just found their way to Angelville. We see, you know, Angelville burnt down and stuff like that. So not too far behind Jesse to a certain extent, but they're still a little ways behind. So 
catching up in their own regard. So that's definitely going to be interesting. So, so, so very excited to have Preacher back. Obviously, this being the final season, I'm kind of sad to know that this is it. But at the same time, I'm so excited to find out how this is all going to play out. Like, is what we saw at the beginning the end of it all? Or is it just a part of the end? So many questions. I'm so excited to see where this season takes us, especially seeing where the next episode in particular takes us. But really, that's all I want to talk about. Until next time we meet, be happy, be safe, love, like to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day and goodbye.